All right. Well, <coughs> let's take a look now at proteins. We know how to assemble amino acids together to make proteins. And we should stop the text messages. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. We know how to assemble amino acids together to make proteins. Now, let's take a look at protein structure because protein function is tip is. Dependent on protein structures, we'll see later on. Okay, now, proteins are not merely floppy chains of amino acids. There's different kinds of polar groups, so side chains, hydrophobic groups, potentials for that are going to attract or repel each other, positive and negative charges on some of those amino acids that will attract or repel each other, and the potential to form hydrogen bonds. There are potential hydrogen bond forming groups. So proteins actually fold up into unique and specialized structures. And those structures are absolutely critical for the functioning of proteins. But the proteins, we have four levels of protein structure. Each, the top levels are going to define what happens with what the nature of the levels below it are. So there's four levels of protein structure, what we call primary structure, and that helps to determine what's called secondary structure. And then there is tertiary structure. And finally, at least in some proteins, what's called quaternary structure. Okay, not all proteins have quaternary structure, but we'll see that later on. Okay, now, primary structure. What is primary structure? Primary structure is simply the sequence of amino acids. For instance, you start out with glycine, and then the next one is proline, and then followed by serine, and so on and so forth to the end of the protein. That's the primary structure, the sequence of amino acids. And of course, amino acids are held together by covalent peptide bonds. Now, primary structure is something we know a great deal about. Because using genetic techniques, although there are chemical techniques that actually successively chop off amino acids off of a protein, and that was used way in the past, Nowadays, the best way of finding primary structure is you get the message of RNA for that protein using molecular biology techniques and knowing the genetic code. In other words, what codon or sequence of three bases represents what amino acids. You do that, you sequence the message of RNA, you get the primary structure, and you type it into a, any of a number of databases, and they will look and scan and compare your protein to everything else in the database. There are hundreds of thousands of primary structures of all kinds of different proteins from all kinds of different organisms in these databases now. And some proteins, if you type a sequence into the database, it comes out and says, okay, the most closest matches are these groups of proteins, and this is 80% identical, and this is 60% identical, and so on. Many times by doing that, you can find the function of a protein because it may well be a version of something that is already in the database that they know the function of. Now, sometimes it's less and less so now that we've sequenced so many genomes, but sometimes you find something that has no close match at all in any of the databases, and you have no idea what it does until you actually investigate at the biochemical level. But we have primary structures of enormous numbers of proteins. Now, when we go to secondary structure, secondary structure is this. Secondary structure is where we have hydrogen bonds forming between different parts of the peptide backbone. We're not looking at the side chains at this point. The side chains are not really involved in secondary structure. Some side chains are big enough to actually prevent secondary structure from forming in particular areas, especially ones with the benzene rings, the aromatic groups as we call them. But they don't really contribute. They may block it in some areas, but they don't really contribute. So let's say here, secondary structure is the formation of hydrogen bonds. Remember we said hydrogen bonds have other roles in addition to the properties of water and nucleic acids. 
And I say the side chains or R groups are not involved. Well, let's take a look. Once again, we're going to make a peptide backbone here, or portion of it. So we have Okay, here's a portion of a protein. Now what we have here, notice we have this group here, a nitrogen with the hydrogen. That gives the hydrogen a partial positive charge because the nitrogen is quite electronegative. Over here we have that carbon with a double bond to the oxygen, giving the oxygen a partial negative charge. And we've got this, 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 this. These are potential hydrogen bond forming groups if you can get them close enough together. If you can't get them with an atomic diameter, so they're not going to form. So the question is, can we get, how can we, what can we do with that amino acid chain to actually get hydrogen bonds forming between those groups? We have to bend or twist it in certain ways. Well, it turns out there's only two possible ways of doing it and getting it to work. Is okay if I raise this? Yes. All right. Okay. One way we can do this is we can take that amino acid chain and make sort of a spiral coil, and you get hydrogen bond forming groups close enough together where we'll stabilize that coil. Now the book's got some much better views of that and stuff than my crew diagrams, but by making a spiral coil, you can get hydrogen bonds forming from the half partial, the N, NH, and the carbon double bonded to an oxygen. You can get that, and that will hold the coil together. Now, this kind of spiral coil is what we call an alpha helix. Helix refers to a coil. So alpha helix, that's a spiral coil. Now, once again, if you happen to have a big, bulky side chain, like the ones with the aromatic groups, the benzene rings, that can frequently block or terminate secondary structure, including an alpha helix. So a protein may have regions of alpha helix and regions that are not alpha helix. Depends on the primary structure, the amino acid sequence. Now there's one more way of making a stable secondary structure. And that's where we take the amino acid chain and go up and down in a series of switchback turns, like going up a mountain road. And then we can get hydrogen bonds stabilizing these switchback terms, like so. Now, in three dimensions, that kind of back and forth switchback loops forms a fairly flat, almost sheet-like structure, kind of like this, if I were to draw here. OK, here we have that. Very recent, thank you, turn around, get on the case. OK. All right, now this is what we call a beta sheet because it is a flat sheet. Now you can take that sheet, like a sheet of paper, and twist it around into sort of a barrel-like thing. Uh, somebody have a piece of paper? I can't do this. The I mean, oh, here, here. Okay, here's a piece of paper. Okay, beta sheet. Okay, now I fold it up a little bit, kind of like so, what we call a beta barrel. Okay, and that's all beta sheet folded up. Okay, so those are the only two ways we can get the appropriate hydrogen bond forming groups together close enough. So a given protein may well have regions of alpha helix and interspersed with regions of beta sheet and other areas where because the very side chains you simply cannot get any secondary structure at all. Okay. Now, since secondary structures held together by hydrogen bonds, those are relatively weak. So heating things up to close to the boiling point is more than enough to break secondary structure down. Okay, that's secondary structure. Once again, the side chains that don't actually contribute to it, although big ones can actually block it in certain areas. All right, now we go to the next two levels, tertiary and quaternary. 
I'm going to kind of lump them together, but I'm going to say the one difference. The tertiary structure is the three-dimensional folding of a single amino acid chain. In other words, a single protein. So we'll put 3D folding of single amino acid chain. And by the way, peptides do have a little, often have a little secondary. Certainly, they have a little bit of tertiary structure, and even though they're fairly small, they will fold them. Now, what is quaternary structure? Quaternary structure is basically the same kind of thing, except for this. Many functioning proteins are not just one amino acid chain; they're a complex of two or more amino acid chains. You can have two of the same kind, or two different kind, or four, or ten, or what have you. Case in point, we use as an example of an enzyme, the enzyme called ADH, alcohol dehydrogenase. The functional enzyme is two identical copies of a particular amino acid chain. Either one of them by themselves do not have the enzymatic activity because the active site is kind of located between the two. The protein that carries oxygen in our bloodstream, called hemoglobin, it has four separate amino acid chains, two of what we call the alpha chains and two of what are called the beta chains. So two of two, two each of two different kinds of amino acid chains. So that functioning hemoglobin molecule is made up of four separate amino acid chains. Now each one, each alpha and beta chain, is indeed capable of binding oxygen, However, it won't give it up. It doesn't do you much good if you're depending on that. But all four put together in the precise quaternary structure can not only bind oxygen and it can also release it in a pH-dependent fashion, which is how hemoglobin works. And there are other proteins that have many different amino acid chains. The muscle protein in the skeletal muscles called mycin. The muscle mycin is actually six amino acid chains. There is another protein, something called pyruvate dehydrogenase that we'll run into. It has 60 separate amino acid chains of three different types. The entire functioning enzyme is as large as some viruses. It's a Haas. It's huge. Okay, so quaternary structure is a three-dimensional arrangement of a protein of a functioning protein that has multiple that's made up of multiple amino acid chains. And you need all those for the function for the molecule to properly function. Okay, now that's the differences, but there's a lot more similarities between tertiary and quaternary structure and differences. So now we're going to lump them together here for a few pointers on this. First of all, what holds tertiary and quaternary structure together? <coughs> okay, folks, this is where the side chains come into action. Because we have polar side chains. They want to face polar environments like other polar amino acids or water, or what have you. You have hydrophobic side chains that want to avoid polar environments, so they rather snuggle together and stay away from anything that's polar. You have positive and negatively charged amino acids. They will attract or repel each other if they're close enough. Some side chains have hydrogen bond forming groups. You can make hydrogen bonds if they're close enough together. So any and all of those things can contribute to tertiary and quaternary structure. So, we'll say side chain interactions. Ah, especially if I can spell today. The most important force that holds protein, tertiary, and quaternary structure together is simply the tendency for polar to want to be in polar environments, like facing water or facing other polar amino acids, and hydrophobic stuff to stay away from polar environments, like staying out of water and things like that. And what we call these things collectively, 
crudely, oil and water or hydrophobic and polar don't mix. So what we call these things collectively is hydrophobic interactions. And that's actually the major force that holds protein, tertiary, and quaternary structure together. It's not the only thing. But it's a major contributor. Now, second thing, you have positively negatively charged amino acids. They can form ionic bonds. Now, since they're in water, the water shields and forms hydration shells around these ions, but still, they can form weak attractions with the opposite charge, or they can repel each other. So this is what we would call ionic bonds. The ionic bonds are very, you know, ones that can even hold together in water are very weak in water. So ionic bonds and proteins, which are in a water environment, are going to be weak. It doesn't take much energy to break them either. And then finally, we get a little bit of contribution again from hydrogen bonds, which are also weak. Now, the most important one, once again, is the hydrophobic interaction. So what happens with proteins is, for the most part, let's make an amino acid chain. Let's suppose this region and this region are loaded with hydrophobic amino acids, which I'll represent by H. The main thing that that protein is going to try to do is fold up in such a way to keep the hydrophobic stuff buried in the interior of the molecule and keep the polar stuff on the outside where it's facing water. Now, of course, if you're a membrane protein, the hydrophobic stuff you want to insert in the cell membrane and keep the polar stuff out of the membrane. So, this protein will tend to fold itself up, so the hydrophobic regions are buried in the middle. And we have polar stuff on the outside, we have a loop of polar stuff on the outside, bury some more hydrophobic stuff, and now some more polar stuff on the outside. Now what we have is this hydrophobic core. Amino acids, the hydrophobic amino acids are in the interior of the molecule, and the polar amino acids are out on the surface facing the water. That's going to be a major thing, major driving force of protein fold. Now, tertiary and quaternary structure will contain regions of secondary structure. Now, the books have much better diagrams than I can make on the board, but I'm going to make a crude protein with tertiary structure, a crude tertiary structure, and then I'm going to make it put another protein and make a crude quaternary structure. So here's our protein. We have a floppy chain of amino acids, and lo and behold, we have a beta sheet region right here, and then a big bulky amino acid disrupt that, and we go into an alpha helix, and it twists around, and let's throw in another alpha helix, and finally, last but not least, we'll throw a third beta sheet in. Okay, so here is a crude representation of a protein's tertiary structure. Notice this one contains two alpha helix and two beta sheet regions. Now let's suppose this alpha helix here is full of hydrophobic amino acids. It's good, it's in water. I want the out of there. Okay, you don't want to be in water. Now let's suppose we have another protein, and it too, as part of its tertiary structure, happens to have of hydrophobic alpha helix right over here. The two are going to stick together, shielding themselves from water. And now this protein here and this different protein here have stuck together because of these hydrophobic regions. We now have a two subunit protein with quaternary structure. Now hydrophobic interactions, by the way, are not the only reason proteins stick together. Sometimes you have regions that are full of positively charged amino acids on one protein and negatively charged on another. The two regions that they can physically fit together will stick by weak ionic bonds. Proteins are loaded up with basic or positively charged amino acids love to stick to negatively charged stuff like nucleic acids. So, DNA and RNA binding proteins, and there are many of them, that includes transcription factors, histones that organize and package the DNA and regulate transcription. Those proteins, those nucleic acid binding proteins, have oodles of positively charged or basic amino acids on the surface. 
They love to stick to the negative charge phosphates on the DNA, and now you've got yourself nucleic acid binding proteins. Okay, so that's a crude idea of tertiary and quaternary structure and what holds it together. Now, question is, why do we go through all this just for some nice pretty pictures? You look at your textbook and you see all kinds of pictures of protein tertiary quaternary structures. And you can also see alpha helix and beta sheet in sort of a ball and stick diagram and a three-dimensional diagram as well. Okay. Now why bother with that? Why is that a big thing? Because you think about it, every week there are several papers, probably more than several at this point, published on tertiary quaternary structure of this protein and that protein. There are labs that do nothing more than determine tertiary and quaternary structures of proteins. One particular protein, case in point, talk about dedication and talk about the importance of tertiary structure. One particular protein, a protein called actin that forms the thin filaments of muscles are a major part of the cytoskeleton of all eukaryotic cells. A lab group spent 25 years trying to determine the tertiary structure of actin. They finally got it. happened to be at the conference that was first presented. And everybody knew this was coming. I was like, <gasps> you know, all drilling on the floor and stuff like that. You get hit with hundreds of people there. You can hear a pin drop. And they finally project this image. There it is. Like the holy grail for the kind of stuff I was working on as a postdoc. It was big, hot, 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 hot news. They spent their whole careers doing that. So, must be very important. Why is tertiary and quaternary structure so darn important? Well, the function of a protein depends on its tertiary and quaternary structure. and quaternary structure define the protein's function that defines its interactions with other molecules and other proteins. Picture this. If you have the active site of an enzyme, to make that active site, you have to put certain key amino acids that will actually do the catalytic reactions in exactly the right three-dimensional space in order for that enzyme to work. If you alter the tertiary structure of that protein, especially at the active site region, those critical amino acids are going to be in the wrong location and the enzyme simply won't work. Okay. The interaction of one protein to next depends on tertiary quaternary structure. Let's suppose we took this amino acid loop that's stuck with this protein and maybe we buried it a little bit deeper into the molecule life. So now, these two could not stick to each other, and that protein interaction is abolished. The proteins will not stick together now because the sticky region is somewhere where it's not supposed to be. So now these things fall apart. Okay. And this happens all the time in nature. Okay, so it's critical for the definition of the function of a protein. Now I'm going to give you one example. Of Most people have probably heard of these of mad cow disease. Remember that one, mad cow disease? We hit the newspaper several years ago. It's a class of disease that are sometimes called spongiform, meaning sponge-like, encephalopathies, meaning something's wrong with the head, specifically the brain. These kinds of diseases cause nerve cells to die, and then you get neurological problems, and you go into a coma and die. And when they do an autopsy on your brain looks like a piece of sponge. It's got holes in it all over the place. Nerve cells that die, die, die. There are things that affect numerous kinds of mammals. There are ones, in fact, one called CJD that affects humans. It's fortunately very rare, but it's an invariably fatal disease. It takes a long time, has a long latency period between exposure and what have you. Well, bottom line is that although it's still a little bit of controversy about it, it appears that these types of diseases are caused by a protein. And that protein is not folded properly in these diseases. 
Turns out there's something we call the prion protein, and that seems to cause these diseases. Prions is a particular protein that's found in the brain cells of all vertebrates. Okay, now, when people realize that these prions that were isolated from Organisms with these kinds of diseases, scrapie, which is a prion disease in sheep, was the first one. So what they do is they grind up sheep brains and feed it to other sheep, and sure enough, they get sick, you know, months to years later. And then they kept on isolating things. They found that giving them just this one protein from an infected sheep could cause this disease. Now, how did that work? Well, they found quickly that. There are prions in everybody's brains, whether you're sick or not. So they said, okay, well, maybe it's a mutation. So they looked at the primary structure of that protein, found the two were absolutely identical to each other. No mutations, no chopping a piece off, no gluing some other piece on. They were, the primary structure was identical. But when they looked at the tertiary structure, they found they were very different. One version was mostly beta sheet. Another version, I think it's the disease-causing version, was almost all alpha helix. The, two, the same protein could fold up in two different ways. They looked like totally different proteins because their tertiary structure was so radically different. Even though the amino acid sequence was the same, the folding pattern was quite a bit different. Now, the hypothesis has been rigorously proven yet, but the disease-causing version might be the molecular equivalent of a vampire. Now, what do vampires do? If a vampire bites you, since vampire films and zombie films are so popular nowadays, what happens to you if a vampire bites you tonight? You fall in love. You turn it on. Well, okay, well, in some <laughs> cases, all right. If she's cute, I suppose. Just you know, watch the fangs. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, you're supposed to turn into one yourself, right? That's how vampires spread. They bite other people and turn them into vampires. Or if you like Star Trek, the Borg does the same kind of thing, the nasty alien race. Okay, well anyway, you look at this. This is the molecular equivalent. Apparently what can happen is the disease prion can occasionally bind to the normal prion, and once in a while, not very often, that's why it's a slow disease, flip it into the other disease conformation. So you start out with one of those molecules, sometime later you get two, and then you get four, and then you get eight, and time, as time goes on, and eventually you get enough of these that starts damaging nerve cells. And one of the reasons is this protein, the disease version, is extraordinarily resistant to being broken down. Almost nothing extremes of pH, protein digesting enzymes, for the most, even things like detergents won't touch this guy. So, this protein is highly resistant, the cell can't get rid of it, it piles up and then kills the nerve cells off. And that seems to be what these pre diseases are. But it tells you, the only difference between these proteins are the two, two versions of proteins are differences in tertiary structure. Gives you an idea of the importance of that. Now, unfortunately, tertiary structure, despite its importance, drug companies spend literally billions of dollars a year determining the tertiary structure of different kinds of proteins. Because once you have that, you can do things like design small organic molecules, drugs, that will fit into the active site of an enzyme, for instance, and jam it shut, shut it off. A lot of drugs are designed that way. First thing you do is you have a protein target, you get the tertiary structure out, and now you design drugs that can fit in and inhibit that protein or do whatever with it. And then you go through the clinical trials. So, for instance, those, a number of those, all those different anti-HIV medications were designed based on the knowledge of the tertiary structure of the protein targets. Those statins, the drugs that are used to inhibit cholesterol synthesis, same thing. They have the tertiary structure, the enzyme that these guys go after. They design drugs around it. That Tamiflu and Relenza, the anti-flu drugs that you can use if you come down as either as a preventative or if you come down with the flu, uh, using the first couple of days, those were designed by getting 
the tertiary structure of a particular enzyme on the surface of the flu virus. So that's the big thing of a drug design out. Identify the protein, get the tertiary structure or quaternary structure, and then design drugs that will fit into the appropriate part and do what you want to do, do with them what you want to do. So billions of dollars a year are spent on tertiary and quaternary structure of protein. They have even flown because some proteins are hard to work with. They've even flown these kinds of experiments up into space. The space station for many years have had experiments where they try to get proteins in a form that they can determine the tertiary structure because sometimes they can't do that earth. Now by the way, quick and dirty, how do you do that? How do you find tertiary structure? It'd be nice if you could type an amino acid sequence into a computer and the pH and the salt concentrations and this and that and have the computer spit out a nice tertiary structure. We ain't anywhere close to that now. The largest supercomputer in the world designed by IBM is designed to try to calculate out tertiary structures. But the problem is you're dealing with hundreds of amino acids. Each one has something that can interact with something else. So now you have to figure out what all these interactions are if you have hundreds of amino acids with scores or hundreds of potential interactions each, the numbers quickly get to be so huge they're almost impossible to calculate out. So the only way to do it is by experiment. The best way of doing it is you take the proteins and you grow them into fine, regular little protein crystals. Just like the same, it's a fancy version, the same thing you used to do as a kid when you had a solution of salt or sugar and you have concentrated syrup and you stuck a string in there and after some days the stuff would evaporate and you get these nice big rock candy crystals. Anybody do that as a kid? Not the crime child. Oh, well, okay, well, he is the, and they taste real good, okay, except for this drink. All right, same basic principle. The problem is protein crystals are a lot harder to get good quality regular crystals out of than sugar is. So sometimes even the force of gravity is enough to disrupt that. That's why you have to do some of them out in space. Okay, well, think with these protein crystals. If you have a perfect crystal, you shine a beam of x-rays through it. They hit the crystal and hit the atoms in the crystal and then they bounce off in all kinds of different directions. And then you have a whole bunch of detectors and those detectors tell you where the bounces of the x-rays are and then with a whole bunch of complicated math generally done on a computer nowadays, you can calculate out the position of all the atoms. <coughs> that technique is called x-ray crystallography and that's a major way of determining protein structure. Problem is, many crisp proteins don't form very good crystals. That's why it took 25 years to get that protein acting because they couldn't make good enough crystals for this kind of stuff. It took them a long time and some real special tricks to do that. Okay, but anyway, that's one way. Another way, and it works only for small proteins, is a variant on the same kind of thing that they do for those MRI scans uses radio waves and causes hydrogen atoms to emit other radio waves. You can do that with small proteins too. It doesn't work very well for large ones, it's just too complex, but it's been done for small proteins. The major reason way is this crystallography. That process can take months to years and you have to have a good powerful source of x-rays in order to do this. Okay, so but people spend an awful amount of time and money trying to determine it because these, the protein structure is critically important for the function of that protein. And that's where we'll leave it off today. We'll look at a few aspects of protein structure when we come back tomorrow. So I'll see you guys in lab.